Uh, thank you guys all so much for coming out for what is either today's least appropriate or most appropriate panel. I honestly have no answer on that one, and we're just going to do the best we can to talk about <laughs> to talk about either something that's necessary or something that's too hard to talk about. So we'll just do our best, but we have four very talented people to talk about escapism and whether it's necessary, whether it's possible, and how we do it. So I guess I really just want to start by defining terms. I guess, and this panel is about escapism and that's sort of a big word and I don't know if we all are gonna be defining it the same way and I think probably we won't be. So each of you guys going down the row, what does escapism mean really to you? Grab a mic. <laughs> you gotta go first. Oh boy, wrong seat. <laughs> Hello? Okay. Um, ah, escapism. I think uh, some place that you enjoy spending time in that is different from your life. <laughs> so a vacation, a TV show, um, leaving somebody else's, you know, seeing somebody else's um, children act up and, and walking away. Um, <laughs> um, I, think, I think just a place that can take you out of uh, your specific uh, concerns and worries and pressures and uh, algida and, uh, and transport you somewhere for a, 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 a period of time and hopefully make you laugh. Can I say same? No, like, that was excellent. That was, that was, that was great. Okay. Um, uh, is this, can you hear me? Uh, you might need to push a button. Oh, okay. Is that this good? No? Or this one? Oop, or uh, share microphones. That, that was a good, <laughs> that, that was like five solid seconds trying to figure out what I'm going to say. <laughs> um, I think maybe, like, and this is, it sounds, this is going to sound like uh, hoity toity. Uh, but it's just because I read it in the book on the plane here, and it sounded pretty smart. Um, like the, I, I th maybe it's the I, the idea of uh, feeling comfortable feeling lost, like if that makes sense. Like that kind of wonderful feeling of you're not sure where things are gonna go, and you're, you're, but you're in a place where you're kind of comfortable with that feeling of unease, which is kind of different from your day-to-day -day routine, uh, whatever. Um, not to keep reiterating what they're saying, so maybe, um, I, I feel like uh, what's interesting to me about escapism, the way they defined it, is um, it's, this cultivated detachment that is fully willing and you are 100% participant in knowing that you're actively believing in something that is false. And I think that's, I, I always think that it speaks to um, how important that is for us as people and for our minds to let go and to have that release and break from the obvious strains of reality. Cultivated detachment. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, to say it more simply and less eloquently, um, I think I think of it as you've had a really long, shitty day, and you come home, or you go to the movie theater, or you go to a concert, you go to that thing, you go to the beach, you go to whatever you can, and maybe all you have is the television, and you can turn that on and be with different people, be in a different place, be with a different uh, point of view than you've had all day and maybe laugh and feel relieved or feel something and all of a sudden you're crying or laughing and the day's gone away. Um, that's me, that's what I think. Now, if I think of escapism and I think of it as being sort of a, a turn off your brain or a turn off your attachment, your emotional attachment, does that make it a negative, do you guys think? Um, oh. My, my husband's given me a lot of notes on my microphone use this, this weekend, so I'm going to try to not move it around. Um, uh, I would hope that, yeah, I, I, I do think there would be, you, you, you want to have investment and a certain emotional investment, and I think, it, but it's, 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 they're not your own problems, so it's somebody else's, so you can get really, really passionate about it, but you can also sleep at night. It's like, um, it's, you know, it's like hearing gossip or something, you know, we all don't want to participate, but there's something so juicy about it. And you just want to know, and you don't want to continue to pile on and contribute, and yet you want all of the details. So I think, to me, that I, I hope that you're watching um, a show like Jane with a, with a real emotional attachment and a real, you know, I, I know people are very, very upset about what happened at the end of the season. Um, I was very upset. Um, and, and uh, so you want you want that specific emotional engagement for sure, but it's just that at the end of the day, 
it's not your fiance that was shot. <laughs> and I think that's the distinction. So hopefully you can access all of that, but then you can also sleep. It's like you're turning off parts of your brain, but you're leaving on, you're leaving on the other parts or you're leaving, you know, your heart is still, your emotions are still in it. So I think that people talked about TV as passive for so long and that's just, that hasn't been my experience, especially in the, this golden age where people want to keep talking about it. They want to go on fan forums. They want to go on Twitter. They want to find everybody else thinking about Like, your brain is not off. Your brain is just in that show and in that world for those moments. So it's, it's, you get to be a participant, I think, whatever you guys said. And yeah, I think especially, too, like making things that are really personal. Like, I would, I would feel horrible if... I, I, you know, I'm lucky enough to, with a team of really talented people, create something that's like pulling from a, you know, the enlisted was very personal and pulling from very personal stories and things. I even had, you know, Dana, Dana was an executive and she worked so on it. She'll lucky. tell you, like, that's very sweetie to say, but uh, like, like it was really, it was hard to write some of that stuff. And I would feel, I'd feel horrible if, if I knew that it was like literally like kind of pouring my guts onto the page and someone was just watching like, what? <laughs> like, like this is heavy. But at the same time, I think uh, like you can't tell an audience how they're supposed to feel. You know, it, I'm it's in my either cubicle crying, yeah. <laughs> watching Kevin's guts. Like just, and it's your story, but yeah. I felt that so much <laughs> and like at the same at the same time I think also like I have to be honest with myself like there is room for the shut your brain off junk food stuff like I I will watch 20 episodes of House Hunters with my HGTV. wife HGTV and yes HGTV, HGTV is brilliant but I don't think I can't ever say I've been emotionally engaged by like <laughs> flip or flop but you know what if it's maybe a flop maybe someday yeah. what if it's a flop <laughs> Well, that, I mean, Justin, do you have, do you have an answer? Or? Um, well, for, for Life in Pieces and the show we do, the, the, our biggest challenge is the show is about, like, relatable moments. So you can be sitting there watching this family that you hopefully connect to saying, that family seems like my family. And the challenge is it can't be across the line into too real where it's something you don't want to be dealing with and watch. Like, we had a big challenge early on with... Um, uh, one of the young couples in our show, um, played by um, Colin Hanks and Zoe Lister-Jones, had a new baby. And there's tons of relatable stories to tell about what it's like to be new parents with a baby. But what we found uh, when we were uh, mixing the early episodes in post was the baby crying was incredibly annoying and no one wants to listen to a baby crying. So how do you tell stories about a baby that won't stop crying without making the audience want to change the channel too because that's the last thing that they want to hear because they have their own babies crying. So it, it is a real challenge to sort of create this escape but also make it feel real and, and, and feel connected to the material. Well, I want to sort of follow on that because as you say, um, for many people, a family reunion of their own family is one horrible nightmare and a family reunion of somebody else's family is perhaps even more a horrible nightmare. <laughs> what is kind of the line of relatability and too much relatability? Well, I think it's, it's trying, to find, um, trying to find what's, what's real, first of all, and then trying to make it funny in a way that sometimes is a little larger than what life is. And by um, creating that sort of delta in between reality and fantasy, you get you can you can you can disengage and you can laugh and you can make that connection that this feels like something you understand and can relate to, but you can totally suspend your disbelief and, and have fun watching it. And, and I mean, it feels yeah. it too like that, that line shifts a lot. Like sometimes you'll have a great you know this is this happened in my family and it's a great story and you'll be in the writer's room and like you'll be telling what you think is like something that would be really good for the show like we can do this and it's awesome and you're just looking at a sea of people looking at you like you're a monster <laughs> like that's not ever going to be funny you can't do that but i think that that can kind of beget a a bigger conversation about how do you do this particular story that happens in your life or to a friend but in the world of the show. Because like your life and the show are two se separate things. That's not the same. Like you can't just put a camera on your life and say this is exactly what people are going to want to consume as a, as a sitcom. You know, there, there has to be a slight adjustment sometimes. And that's what all of these people are very talented at doing is finding the kind of catharsis in that tension and, and in those moments that you, you, know, you actually have the chance to go back and rewrite it. And the thing you wish you said or the thing you wish that happened or just the disaster. But 
there can be a real, that's why it's comedic tension, right? Because you let go of that tension and can laugh about it. And there's, I think there's a real catharsis in seeing some of that play out and then you can laugh and think about it the next time you're in, at that family reunion. Well, I mean, Kevin, it seems to me like escapism is one thing and almost the other side of the coin is confrontation and a lot on Enlisted. Even when you were being funny about things, you were attacking sort of veterans' rights issues that people are not attacking on TV. How did you approach when you felt like you had buttons? You and they're not look? attacking them now either. <laughs> yeah. No, no, of course, and of course it's true because we're trying not to, you know, engage yeah. with that. Yeah. Exactly. So how, what is the line where you're like, okay, I'm telling you something that you need to know and that you need to pay attention, but I'd also kind of like you to laugh about it. I think, I mean, it, we tried to never, and Dana can back this up because she was a, a key part of it. Like we tried to never go at it with the attitude of like, here's something you need to know about, you know, because then it almost feels like you're teaching a lesson to somebody. Um, I feel like every, every time we, we dealt with those stories, it was, uh, there was an, we built to an emotional payoff that kind of played out over the course of the season. And instead of saying, well, this is going to be a very special episode about, you know, someone who needs to go to therapy and doesn't want to go. Um, we tried to do, do and kind of to draft off of what Dana was just saying, like you, in, in real life, that might be a, a long conversation with a loved one and a back and forth and people are crying and it's miserable. But in the world of a sitcom, when you've got, you know, 20, 21 minutes or whatever it is now, you can kind of distill that that big emotional story into like maybe one moment, you know, like there's an episode where he goes, the, the main character didn't, doesn't want to go to talk to anybody, doesn't want to talk about his problems. A story plays out at the same time that kind of informs maybe why he should talk about what's going on in his life. And then the episode just kind of ends with him dealing with it. And it builds to kind of like a very quiet emotional moment. If in real life, that would have been a scene, uh, like, a, you know, it would have been a, a litany of, of back and forths, but on TV, you can kind of just take one little thing that sits with you, and, 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 and that is the, uh, that, that can say everything, even if it's a quiet moment. I think that's what the power of the medium is. You can, you can kind of distill emotions into, into even, you know, even, I love, like, wordless things, like the, uh, you know, like the handhead thing in, um, uh, on Enlisted, that's like totally stolen from Up. Like, you know, you know that movie Up, <laughs> where it, like the, the cross your heart thing and Up? That like slays me every time, because it's just like a little tiny thing that they do, but it carries tons of emotion. And I like, that's a trick that TV can do that in real life that doesn't, it does, there's no translatable thing in real life for that. And, and so much about sort of the concept of escapism, and this is for Jenny, is, is sort of the ability to maybe not wholly engage. And I find that uh, Jane is one of those shows that I can't partially engage in, I, you know, because if, because if I look away, I've missed 20 lines of dialogue in Spanish that I don't speak well enough to understand. I've missed 15 jokes courtesy of on-screen text and hashtags that, I, that I've utterly missed. What is sort of the balance between knowing that you're working, playing off of a genre that is designed to be sort of half-watched, you know, the soap opera and the telenovela, they're designed to be only partially watched, but also doing a show that if you half-watch, you miss half the jokes. Yeah, I, I just didn't want people to be able to half-watch it, honestly. <laughs> um, you know, because we put a lot of time into these things. No, um, you know, I, I just, I felt like it was going to be a whole, like, if you look away, you're going to miss three type on jokes, you're not going to understand what Alba's saying, or in, unless you do. Um, but you might not understand check then, because we also have check. Um, you know, so I, I did want it to be, I wanted, I was, when I was thinking about the show, you know, the way that we watch TV and we're tweeting along with it and we're looking at our phones and we're reading how much we read now. Um, and we tell jokes th through Twitter and all of that kind of stuff. I wanted to build into the DNA of Jane and that was part of the thought process, um, you know, there's parts you pay attention to at different rates, um, you know, and, and, you know, when we have a character like uh, Rogelio, who's, a lot of his journey is about escapism, and, and you know, I might not want to make a, a big uh, statement on, on it, or if I want to make any statement, I can just put it into his time-traveling telenovela, where he's inspiring women, the women suffragettes, and, and, and kissing Susan B. Anthony in a very sexy way. Um, and and uh, I can give a little bit of, this is silly, right? You know, um, so, so it's, it's that combination where nobody would probably want to hear me sitting and talking about, um, you know, what, what progress we still need in the women's movement. But I can do it through Rogelio, and you guys can laugh, and then I've said it. So I think that's part of um, the fun of, of this show in particular, is that you get to say all these things, but you get to say it in a really light, fun way, and 
make it a little bit more ridiculous. Um, but you, 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 can't, you can't really half watch it. <laughs> or you can, but you'll miss a lot. <laughs> and, and Dana, you come at this from a, from a different perspective. You, you're in development at a network that has been shifting its comedy brand in recent years. And I'm sort of curious as to how, when you're curating what a brand is and what comedy means in a brand, how this concept comes into that. A lot of development meetings. Um, I think one of the things that really made me want to come to TV land is they were redefining the brand and they were trying to figure out what that next thing was. And, you know, with one million outlets and, and trying to figure out, okay, where's our little slice of that and where is it going to be? And I think Younger became a real touch point in that because it was, you know, it's a half hour comedy soap. It's from Darren Starr. He knows escapism. <laughs> like, and I think like we've been talking about that, there's a reality to it, absolutely. But then there's, of course, the fantasy. There's, you know, it's New York, it's romance. And I think as we develop shows, you know, I've gotten pitched shows at the IRS and at the DMV and I'm like, do we want to spend half an hour? <laughs> do we want to spend half an hour at the DMV? It's literally the least, <laughs> like no one on earth wants to be there. So I think, um, you know, the only way you could save a show like that is with the characters because, you know, you could be in, you know, the office and it was the characters that was your escapism. Like, cause even though Michael Scott was that guy, you <laughs> wish you had him as your boss. You wish you could have a crush on Jim. You wish you could have all those things. So like it, even if, I, th I think that's what we're looking for is that, you know, everyone talks about likability. I, I don't really know if that's what it is, especially with women, everyone that's gonna be likable. And, um, but I think it's more, do you wanna spend time with them? It's an intimate medium, you know, do you wanna invite them in your house for a little while? Do you want to spend your train ride with them? And um, I think, honestly, it comes down to characters every time and what we're, because we're doing comedy, so, um, but by the way, if anyone has a Hawaii show to pitch, <laughs> I'm right on there. <laughs> well, I think that's a great point, and I think it goes back to the title of this panel and sort of, it's not just comedy, but it's also characters that give you a break, and, and a lot of sort of the best characters on comedies are people who in your real life you would never under any circumstances want to actually deal with, but for 22 minutes a week, you're fine with it. If Michael Scott was your boss, you would quit, for 20, <laughs> but for 22, or you'd wish you could, but for 22 minutes a week, you're like, okay, I can, I can laugh at him and maybe that's cathartic. For you guys, talk about sort of crafting characters and crafting villains that we want to hiss at, but we can step away from when the show's over. Well, one thing about the Michael Scott, uh, I remember, with and the, 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 like, when, when The Office was first on, at a certain point when The, when the Office was on, I had a Michael Scott-esque boss and, and everybody recognized it. But it was so inspiring because we were all just like picking things that would be in our specs. <laughs> so it was just like, I got that, you got that. And like, it made the, the fact of our day-to-day -day just so much more fun. So I mean, that, that was its own escape. Um, what were you saying about, I got lost on Michael Scott, I got brought back to a memory. No, just cra crafting that sort of character who you're willing to spend the 22 minutes a week with, but as opposed to wanting to actually nine to five with, as it were. Yeah, I mean, if you were, if you were probably sitting with Rogelio and he, you know, and he was just always talking about himself and, and showing you his headshots and his Twitter feed, you'd, you'd want to kill him. But you know, you can put it, uh, other people can react to it, it's fun to, react to somebody and then be able to turn them off and, and, and have it end. And I think, um, you know, it, it's also, there's just, you, there, there's something, you have, there has to be something redeemable in, in my mind about every character, that they're motivated by something, that they care about something, you know, not just an arch villain who's just an arch villain is, is I find uninteresting, but an arch villain who just has this one woman she loves and, and really wants to uh, do what she can and she might change her face so that she can have another chance at love <laughs> is, is more and more... Uh, I get it. Yeah, yeah, is, more, um, is m more fun to me and also it, it will never happen, so that's the escapism part. But I, I think you have to attach to characters, every character, the villains, the uh, heroes, every, every character is their own hero um, and I think I think of that when, when writing, that I have to take a pass through the script 
from every character's point of view. So no character is just like a, a turning somebody else's plot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they all have their own motivations. And I think if, if you do that, then at least you know who the character is. And then there's like, you know, you can expect what they'll do or you might get wrong, but you know, there's some engagement there. Um, and then always the ability to turn it off. And you have those <laughs> arguments over the characters. Yeah. Like if people are like, no, they would not do this. Yeah. And it's like, you created it. <laughs> so. <laughs> There's like something kind of thrilling too, and this is like something like as a writer, like you keep growing and growing. God knows, I, I still am. And I, I, I think when I was younger, I was almost like scared to write about horrible people. Like you'd be like, I can't write about that. That's awful. And then as you get older, you're like, well, no. It's it, 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 like you start to talk about escapism, but escapism. There's a thrill in throwing yourself into writing a, a man or a woman who is just awful, like <laughs> who is doing horrible, terrible things, because you get to live, live a little bit through that. And you can, you know, that's the great thing about TV. You can always pull it back. You can always say this is too far. But the second you kind of let go, at least for me, the second I just, I learned how I can just let go and just if someone's awful, they're awful, and you know, they're, they're shitty to people. It's kind of thrilling. Like it's, it, you know, nice people are fine, but it's so much fun. It's so much fun to write a bad guy or a bad girl. Well, Justin, for you on that, uh, the fam, the core family in Life in Pieces, they're all fairly likable, and that's sort of a good thing on one hand, but it's also presumably a challenge on the other because there's no one who's a clear adversary, who's a clear villain. We don't really hate any members of these families, so how does that then play into writing in guest characters, you know, sort of the inevitability that every boss has to be an adversary? Um, it, it's actually really challenging right now because of, um, and I don't want this to go off topic into um, diversity, but having a white family um, who's our our core cast, and you're trying to show something that represents sort of the world, um, there's an encouragement and a pressure and also a, a willingness on, and desire on our part to cast as many diverse people as we can in the guest roles. But oftentimes, the guest roles are the villains. They're the, the jerk neighbor next door who's um, creating conflict with our core characters. And um, that's a real challenge for us because then suddenly, you're, you're creating a situation where you have these um, ideally warm, you know, hopefully lovable, kind people um, in this family, um, and then, and they're white, and then you got everybody else who's the villain. It does create, it does create a challenge for us. Now, Dana, obviously you're seeing countless pitches. I have no idea how many you see on a weekly or monthly basis. How do you describe to the Hollywood community what you guys are looking for? What are you saying, this is, what, this is our brand, this is who we are, what we want? Well, we, we actually make it pretty specific, and I, I hear a lot less pitches now that I'm in cable. Yay. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think we, we really focus on adults. We're not trying to get you know, teens and 20-somethings were 30s and 40s and, and everyone older as well, obviously, but I think we're really interested in those moments in people's lives and those moments in our characters' lives and what they're going through as you kind of enter the next stage of adulthood. So it's not, I just move into the big city and, you know, it's, it's not like, and we've all got a place together, but um, those shows are great. I've worked on those shows. Wait, can I, can I have that? Can I use that as a show? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds good. We have like four. But anyway, um, and it, it's more like, okay, I am maybe getting married. I may be starting a new career. I may be having kids. I may be being not satisfied with any of those things and maybe and so that's kind of what we're looking for and you know in our new iteration we're really trying to you know premium everyone likes to say premium i don't think anyone's out there being like i'll have the discount one but um <laughs> but like we're really trying to go for that kind of golden age of like the showtime comedies that are really character character based and um that's that's where it starts for us so um and i think we're really fascinated by that kind of moment. Like we're rebooting First Wives Club right now, which is like a really, like, <laughs> I think you'll like it. Um, but that was a really interesting thing to think about because that movie, which all of us love, is 20 years old, made in the 90s, it, it titans of comedy in it, and it, but it's really talking about marriage and you can't say what you said 20 years ago about marriage and women. 
you know, you can't, you, can't, it, it, you can't say that for five years ago. You know, you have to say, and you guys have done an incredible job about motherhood, you know, like, and, and sisterhood and all of those things as well. But like, so it's, it's what's, what's happening right now and what's happening in, um, so like, that's what we're going to try and do with the new one is, is think about what is marriage and divorce like for women right now. That's what we want, divorce shows. Well, going with the way that we've been thinking about escapism such as it, is, as it is, the three of you guys have all been most worse recently working on network, and I'm sort of wondering if there are different styles, different homes for shows that feel more and less escapist. Like, is network where, quote unquote, escapist humor is? Does cable do something darker? Are single cam comedies darker? Are multi-cams more, quote unquote, escapist? Does, does it feel like there are specific trigger words almost? No, I mean, I don't know if anyone's ever going to, although I was going to say Kimmy Schmidt's not dark, but one of, the, one of the huge powers of that show, it, which is why I love it, is because it's insane and, and hilarious, but there is a very clear subtext of trauma, of, like, of heavy stuff, and the show does an amazing job dealing with it. And it's, it's funny, because like, my initial, like, you know, I'll make a smart-ass comment was like, no, of course, like the, there's no difference, but I, I don't know. I mean, I think that, I think you can get away with a lot darker shit on streaming and on, on cable. Obviously, um, I think a, there's maybe a little bit less pressure uh, to do you know to do the joke 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 kind of thing uh, if you're a comedy. Um, you know, I can't imagine if like if you, like I, I think Master of None is a great show and I, like a great show. I wonder if that was on a network if they'd get hammered and be like, come on, less less talking about parents and more jokes, like which would be horrible. Like the parents episode of that show is one of the best. Yeah, it, it's, I think it's a brilliant show. So, but I don't, honestly, I don't know. I feel like to me at least, it feels like cable's kind of drafting off of streaming a little bit, but the reverse is also happening where streaming's sort of drafting off of uh, off of networks a little bit. Uh, Jenny or Justin, either one of you guys? Justin. Uh, I, I think, well, it's, it's a tough question. I, I, I think um, being on network TV, trying to do a comedy that's grounded, that feels real and relatable, um, yet is funny, um, there's definitely situations where um, we found ourselves finding and understanding what is real and pulling back from it because it is too raw or it is, um, it is too dark and it shifts the tone of your show. And that's a real big challenge for all of us up here is always sort of keeping your tone in focus and finding that sweet spot and not letting it waver on one side or the other. And when you can, you know, go dark because life is so often dark, uh, it can really disrupt your tone in a way where it's sort of hard, hard to pull back. So that's a definite, definite challenge for us on network because on cable you can, you can go there and there's an expectation, I think, to go there. Well, is there the perception that sort of if a broadcast network is broad, that broad becomes another sort of word that's associated with escapism? Like, do we feel like the largest available audiences are looking for escape rather than, again, confrontation as the opposite word? I, and maybe they are. I, I, maybe shoot. Um, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like, do, do you limit a show if you if you aren't going down that sort of mainstream comforting? I path? mean, there is something very comforting about you know a show, and they do it so well. But like the Big Bang Theory, where they do the same thing, you know what you're getting every week. I mean, obviously the characters are defined; it's all character. But you know, it, no one is going to get shot. No one is going, you know, like that. You know what you're looking for, and and I think you can. The episodes are all going to follow those rules, and I think it does come down to a lot of expectation because if that show was on cable or streaming, I, it just couldn't. It, it would exist. It, it exists as a network show, and I think there is, you know, this, the the escapism on uh, on on cable and and on streaming is more, I think, in the Game of Thrones, um, you know, that kind of escapism. Uh, the comedy is, is more, you know, uh, girls makes you uncomfortable and also makes you laugh, but makes you uncomfortable. It's a different kind of feeling um, that, that you're expecting when you're watching it. And so I think, you know, the, the, med the, uh, what's, the platform really does, uh, it, in combination with the expectations, drive the, the product a little. I do think that, that just because there's so much TV and everybody wants to stand out, I think things are narrowing a little, and I think different kinds of shows are getting made, and 
uh, you know, I guess on streaming they have Fuller House, which is huge, right? I guess it was huge. I mean, so... Supposedly. <laughs> yeah. We don't actually know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, although, but, like, a million Teen Choice nomina- nominations. Like, I mean, people are watching, so... They're, and, and they're not looking for, um, you know, to... Uh, understand the meaning of life. They're, they're looking to, uh, to look at familiar characters and to feel warm. So I, I think that that is powerful um, and what a lot of people are looking for. I think Jenny's right too. The, I, I want to say your point about the platform because I think so much of it is about trust with the audience and the audience has to trust the show before you can kind of take things to that next leap a lot of t- especially in comedy and so your first season especially if you're on a broadcast show it's like you're just trying to keep people around right you're just trying to keep people coming back every week and once you establish that trust with the audience then you can kind of go out and if you're on a different platform where I'm sitting down to watch Master of None and I'm already buying in I've bought in you can hopefully take them somewhere a little quicker but um, I think it's hard because season one like everyone says like oh we haven't earned that yet we haven't earned that no that's a great point it's I keep as we're talking I keep thinking of stuff like that it, I feel like this is a conversation that isn't for right, that isn't, not, not for right now, that this is a conversation that's always been had, you know, because uh, you think about a show like Roseanne. Roseanne could do both of those things brilliantly. It could be real and it could be about real things, but then hysterically funny, and even at some points, you know, kind of otherworldly, crazily funny. You know, the, 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 the barometer of real on that show was so great because it would, you know, families are nuts, and it embraced it in, like in, in a perfect way. So, I, I do think that you're, Dana's totally right. Like you have to, a first season of a show is so hard. You want to hook people in, but I, the, the, like there's a joke that it used to be that networks would uh, give you notes and be like, "This needs to be more funny. This needs to be more funny. This needs to be more funny." And now the notes you get are, uh, "This needs more heart. This, where's the part where people cry?" Like it, it's those tables have shifted a little bit. Well, what do you think has shifted that? I think if there's a, a bulk of product that is kind of, I, I shouldn't refer to stuff as product, that's horrible. But if there's a lot of shows that are go with, very, go with con- <laughs> Yes, go with content <laughs> instead. Content, that's what I'm sorry. <laughs> Discount product, come on. Um, but if, there, if there's a lot of shows that are very similar and kind of ma- coming from the same point of view and making the same jokes, and let's be honest, for a great long while, it was rich white guys making shows that had a very limited you know, life experience you know, it's like let's just make you know. It's like punch the clock, punch the clock comedy. You know, we all I know which we we all know which shows I'm talking about. Um, uh, and th- and thank God, and pat ourselves on the back. I don't think any of us have ever done any of those, which is pretty cool feeling. Like, but I think after a certain amount of time, like people just you you want more. You know, you can't eat cake every day. You want something a little deeper. And I think as people, you know, different types of people, and there's a, God knows there's a shitload of progress that needs to be made still, but as different types of people came in with different types of stories, they're like, well, we don't have to tell kind of the trickly cheesy stuff every week. We have a camera here. Like, we can do something totally different. And, and you know, the networks were willing to take a chance at that. Well, you mentioned uh, Roseanne, and uh, already this festival this week gave an award to Norman Lear. And so, you know, anytime someone, anytime a show basically goes after issues, we go, ah, the, the, the ghost of Norman Lear, yeah. even though the real guy's still here. It sort, of, it sort of hovers over that. And I'm wondering, is your perception that the Norman Lears and the Roseannes have always been the outliers, that, that that's never been sort of a mainstream thing, and so that hasn't shifted in any way. It's always just been the exceptions who have done that. I, I, and I would say that that's probably true, that you've got a, it's a lesser percentage of shows that are, that are skewed towards the Norman Lear style versus, you know, big, broad, crazy comedy, because it is, a, it's, you know, these are, to be really, like, blunt and crappy about it, it is a business. Like, these guys are, run, are running corporations, basically, that are, like, you know, fifty, sixty million dollars invested. Yeah, and it's you're, not and, even a small business. No, huge. It's like so a real they're business. bosses of t- of hundreds of people. You know, so there is an like you better put out something that the most people are going to like. It's 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 hard in that situation. Uh, and when I was in it too, to say like, well, I'm going to do my little art project this week. It's like you you're answering to a lot of uh, different masters. You know, and I think you have to earn the trust of those people, and, ha- and frankly, have a show that's successful enough to then get to a point where you can go, okay, now we're gonna dig a little bit deeper. Dana, do you feel at this point like you're one of those masters? 
yes, I'm a total master. I know exactly what I'm doing all the time. Uh, it's, I, I sat and cried with a few of, uh, in the Norman Lear documentary, and, and you realize how much of this has already happened so many times before, and how, you know, this, like, no one, no one opened the door and told him, like, let's do, like, he got so much pushback and so much censorship, and and that was and once he was a visionary with tons of jobs, then then it was okay, you know. Yeah. And like and I think about even Modern Family. I remember Modern Family; they couldn't sell to certain advertisers at first because of the gays, you know. And and people were scared of it. But then it was a giant hit, and no one cared. As soon as it makes money, you can do whatever you want. But um, so it. I think that there are a lot of incredible executives and platforms all over town that are willing to say, I don't care if I know it's going to make money yet. I don't care if it's, it, this is a story that needs to be on the air. This is a story that needs to be told. So I think, yeah, it takes, it, it takes an incredible amount of trust. You're the first person to trust it. And then the audience comes next. Now, there's no right or wrong answer to this, but on a day like today when, you know, if you turn on most TVs, the horror is what's going to jump out, how quickly do you personally seek out laughter? I mean, how, how quickly do you go, okay, I can only deal with this for so much? I, this morning, I turned on the news, saw the first sh shooting news, then the other shooting news, and... Uh, I looked at it for a few minutes. I said, okay, they don't know anything yet. I have to come on a panel in like an hour. So I'm going to put on a podcast and laugh. Like it was, it was, it was pretty, I remember the night of September 11th. <laughs> I just said September 11th on this panel. Um, but I watched Wayne's World. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, because like, because there's only, there's not, you have, you're powerless. There's nothing you can do in these bad situations. So like I go pretty quick <laughs> into a funny thing if I can. Oh, yeah, just, it's, I think it's, especially like on the, today when my, my kids and my wife are, you know, 2,000 miles away in California, I, I think I, I like, I like I, I, it's very hard for me to go right to, now I need to laugh, you know, I think, and maybe it's part of my psyche, I think I need to sit with something like this and even f figure out how I even feel about it. Um, just because I think it'd be maybe easier if I was sitting with them and I can hug my kids and I'm like, okay, the, the world's not as scary as I thought, as I, as I know it is, right? Go ahead. Well, I, I personally, I am too quick to try and find the comedy in something and always have to be careful at the insensitivity of that. And I think a lot of people in a lot of writers' rooms do that. And I think that comes from our own discomfort yeah. of sitting with the reality and, uh, of, of the emotion. And again, it's sort of, again, our own um, you know, cultivated detachment. It is our, our own escape from what is painful and what is real and what is tough to think about or feel. And so we're often very quick to make jokes, especially when you're around a lot of comedy writers. Um, and it's something that we always sort of have to be careful of, wait a second, like this is not the way the rest of the world is necessarily yeah. reacting at this moment. So it's a challenge, it's tough. I would say it's so, um, I, I, you, you don't wanna, I, I, I personally, when I wake up and hear this, I start reading about it, and I just really, I, because it's so horrible, I want to like give it time to feel. I want to feel it, and I, I, I read a lot of articles about it, and I am thinking about these so many people. It like I have to access that because otherwise, you just feel like these are so many lives that just left. Like I feel like I want to sorry, <laughs> but I, I feel like I want to think about these this event and these this thing that's happening. So I try to, you know, I, I read and think, and you know, you retweet all the things that are about gun control, and it's, um, but, and you think about the people, it's just the people. And so I, I spent the morning thinking about that, and I didn't realize, like, until then I came to a, a different panel uh, before this one, and it was really funny, and it, it was really, really funny, and I was laughing, and I was laughing a lot, um, and I, I thought all of the panelists were great, and I, um, and I don't think, again, until you just asked that, 
like that's comedy, that's the escape, you know, because I wasn't thinking about that, and now then you asked this question, and I'm thinking about it again. <laughs> <laughs> really, really having a hard time, but no, I mean, th there is something to that, and to that experience, and to being able to watch something, I mean, that's, that's what escape is, and you, you do feel so um, powerless in those moments, and I do think there is something valuable about that hour that I had where I was laughing and thinking, and then I have my own guilt of like, well, I'm lucky I get to have that hour of laughing and thinking. It's a really complicated thing. It's a really complicated world, and I feel like, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, it's just so awful, I guess is my answer. <laughs> well, going with what uh, Justin said, um, you know, there's the, when you're with a group, a group of comedy writers, there's going to always be the faction that's going to say, you have to be able to make jokes about anything. You have to be able to make jokes about anything immediately. That's, that's what comedy is, uh, and then there will be the, faction that will say, oh, you have to wait three weeks, or you can never make a joke about this. Where do you guys personally stand on the, is it okay for everything to be funny? Are there certain, are there boundaries and limits for what can be funny? I mean, for me personally, there are. Like, I, I, there's, there's no joke in this to me, um, and there will never be. There's not, I don't think racism is funny. I don't think sexism is funny. I mean, I can find an angle where somebody is laughing at that person maybe, but it has to say something. I, it's just like, and everybody's different, and everybody is, you know, and there's no right or wrong, but to me there's nothing. There's no, it's not funny. It's just not. So, I don't know, I'm a downer, but. <laughs> no, it's, it's tough because we'll have a lot of debates in the writer's room of, is this appropriate to make fun of this? And, and there's too many double standards. The, the one thing I'm always scared, I won't like touch religion, because I, there's, there's been wars fought over religion for many, many centuries. So I, I, to me, that feels like a place where I'll never go. Um, but there's been issues that come up in stories we, we've tried to tell. We had a story about um, uh, one of the characters, again, the, the um, Colin Hanks and Zoe Lister-Jones characters, who are working professionals who, had, uh, who hired a nanny. Um, and there was this um, a story that we were going to do about it was Christmas, and they gave their nanny a Christmas bonus, and they paid her for, for the week of Christmas off. And she happened to be the grandmother of another character in the show. Um, uh, and that other character wound up bringing her grandmother to Christmas. And meanwhile, this young couple with this new baby is struggling to get their baby to fall asleep so that they can join the Christmas dinner. And the nanny is amazing at getting the baby to fall asleep what do you do? You paid her, but she's not working and it's Christmas. Is it wrong to ask her? Is it not? And um, there was a big debate in our writer's room over, is this elitist? Um, is it racist that the one Latino woman who's there, uh, you know, in a group of, of white people is the one being asked to, you know, quote unquote, work, whatever. And it created, it, it creates this sense of where you say, well, we, we did make fun, you know, of a lot of other things. So why was it okay to make fun of that stuff and then it's not okay to poke fun at this? So it's, a, it's, it's always a debate. It's always, you know, it comes down to judgment and what you think. But I think if you start censoring yourself, it can be a slippery slope where suddenly you, it's hard to make fun of anything. So... Um, well, and you just prove it's, it's I think it's, if there's thoughtfulness behind it and if there is like and that's why it's so great to have a room full of people where you're discussing it and you have different perspectives you can go at it i think if there is a thoughtfulness to it if there's a carelessness and especially even it's not funny like it's all those things like then that's obviously it's so wrong but then there's other things that, yeah, you don't want to avoid talking about things. You don't want to avoid, like, you know, there was the whole rape jokes thing, the rape jokes, you know, with, with Tosh and all that, but then, and, and some people said you can never make them and you can never ever do anything, ever. It's never funny. And then, if, if Amy Schumer had listened to that, we wouldn't have that Friday Night Light sketch huh. that, you know, like, we wouldn't have that sketch, which was funny in a completely different way and shed light on that in oh, it, it shed light on the ridiculousness and the ludicrousness of that situation that like, you know, so that was completely her perspective and her writer's perspective and you can tell. So like, it, it, it's the thoughtfulness behind it. it it's the, the, the 
thought cr- like the crew and I think that's that's where it gets hard where people send out a tweet you know like you, you can't just necessarily be like hey is this offensive to like your buddy next to you like you know like but when they're sitting in the rooms and everybody's weighing in you can tell that there's care behind it I think it's it, it, I, when I was younger like I was totally you know of the mindset like you could make a joke about anything you know how dare anyone tell you that you can't and I think as I've gotten older I've realized and especially now with social media and everything like that you just have to realize that everything you say is going can potentially start a conversation and that every joke that you make it's it's you're not just throwing it out there into the ether and going hey I make a, a TV show whatever like you, you know I can do I, I have freedom carte blanche to do whatever I want like you are now responsible for that engagement. And if you're not prepared to talk about it and explain the reason why, uh, then I frankly feel like you shouldn't do it. Like you have to realize that there is a power behind it uh, and that everyone's gonna take things differently. And if, and it does eventually boil down to a gut check. Like, do it, do, does it hurt my soul to say this? Is it worth it for a joke? Like, if you know, I might laugh at something, but is this gonna hurt somebody? Um, and, and I know that's a whole other conversation about can words hurt, and I, I frankly think they can, you know. So, but I just realized I think you have to know that uh, you're you're going to engaging be engaging people and starting a conversation. And like I said, if you're not willing to have it, then you shouldn't make the joke. Do we have any questions from out in the crowd? Um, you mentioned Wayne's World on a particularly horrifying evening. Uh, I was curious as to what your um, go-to escapes are. If there are movies, TV shows, podcasts, etc., that you like to go to during less than pleasant times? That's a really good question. Um, I think I have so many. I have so many. I'm sure like everybody has a sick movie, right? Like I, I, I think every Pride and Prejudice adaptation is my sick movie. <laughs> every uh, Ang Lee's Sense and Sensibility, um, those are like, oh, but by the way, when my fiance and I were so, so, so sick last um, New Year's, it was not hungover, we were just had the flu. Um, we couldn't handle anything except the West Wing. We couldn't <laughs> handle anything, like nothing. We could, like it was just the right amount of emotion when you like, and, um, and then yesterday we were just crying, but like um, at, that, at that, but like, I think that we all, there's so many, right? And, and yeah, we, I think we watched like four seasons and then. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Netflix all, all the time. Mine's uh, it, it's uh, film scores and podcasts. Like I'll just I'm a score nut, so I'll just like you know my wife's like, what are you doing? I'm like listening to the Rocketeer score for the fifth time today because it's a bad day. <laughs> um, and, and like this morning even like it's funny you were we were saying before like I I, I put on uh, like there's a interview a WTF like I, like mainline those. I'm like let me just let me let me just dive into this conversation and be a. a Sideliner, so I don't have to think about the awful shit that's going on. Uh, the Bachelorette. Uh. Yes, yes. I mean, the, to me, reality is escapism. My husband comes into the room. He's like, "Why are the women yelling again?" And it's just always one form of the Real Housewives. And he's just like, "Their their 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 voices are haunting my dreams." Um, but for me, I, I that I can watch with like one eye on and the other eye typing and and. Uh, I don't know, it's just their, their problems are so crazy and they're all so crazy and, um, and they're just so crazy. Um, and, and, but so they're delicious. people, but like, so I'm like, who are these people? And to me, that's, that's escapism because I'm not looking for the, like, how is it going to resolve at the end and what's my emotional heart going to be? I'm just going to leave it thinking they're still crazy. Um, Justin? Uh, r- right now it's Game of Thrones for sure for me in terms of just being able to look forward to that hour every week where I completely cut off my life and am lost for, you know, for that time. And I always look stupidly because I'll, I'll often, I have three little kids and so often I, ha- I have to watch it later that night on DVR and I'm always looking, I'll pause and see how much time has gone by. If it's 20 minutes, 40 minutes, I'm like, oh, there's only 20 minutes left. Oh, there's only 10 minutes left. And it's like, it's so heartbreaking as I'm getting closer and closer to the end because then reality will set back in very quickly. I also just have to say Drag Race because they're so mean. Oh my God, the show's they're amazing. They're so mean and amazing and there's so much heart. And like when you have a bad day, you just wish RuPaul could just like read your boss and like read everything. Like I've been binging that lately. It's, that might be the best show on TV It might be right the best. Yeah. It might. It, the Bachelorette like was my gateway. Now like it's like, uh, I, I just and they're so honest and then they work it through. It's so, it's amazing. 
Uh, so I actually have a question for Dana specifically. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's actually about the uh, First Wives Club reboot, because you mentioned that earlier. And, uh, you know, a lot of people that are fans of the book and the movie are excited to see this TV show, but there is some concern the the cast, that the cast is a little young. Heavy weighs the crown. <laughs> so I'm just curious what the uh, thinking was behind that to have them so much younger than the I just think, movie. like, old people are gross. You know what I mean? <laughs> ew. Ew, ew, ew. Like, what am I going to do? Like, put them in, like, magazines? Uh, <laughs> No, like, this, honestly, if you knew, like, how many meetings were talked about, were talked about how we were going to do this, how we were going to do this justice, um, I think also, by the way, like, TV Land, before, you know, like, they had Hot in Cleveland, so, like, I, I mean, like, there's been a, amazing history of television, of, of women, you know, kind of finding their new... Um, and I think we really, honestly, what I was saying before is that we wanted to think about marriage. And I know, I know, I'm in my 30s. I know people in their 30s that are going through their first divorce or maybe more. And, and, um, and they're so, so inspiring and amazing to me. And, and like, I have a friend that's a cancer survivor and getting a divorce, she does not give a shit. <laughs> Like, she's in the most incredible, like, she's already gone through everything, you know what I mean? And there's a freedom to that. And so I think that's honestly, and like, our writer, Rebecca Adelman, who's incredible, I worked on with New Girl, she's divorced, she's in her 30s, and we have Jenny Bix, who's like incredible from Sex in the City, and so we just wanted to kind of talk about marriage, talk about divorce right now. And that's, it, it, it had nothing to do with, you know, like let's get let, let's make sure we have some young sexy ladies, but um, I think that was just the point in their lives that we're really fascinated with, and we, and we I really think the spirit of the movie is going to be there. I promise, probably. Other questions from out in the crowd. From this weekend and having fun, what would you write as like a little situation comedy that happened to you? You're making us work? <laughs> How dare you? What I'll happened to a skate? I, I really I, did briefly fall in love with um, one of the, the, in the middle of the biker uh, situation. <laughs> I was lost, and, and, and this man came, and Jamie had gone a different way, and there was this one man who came as a beacon of light <laughs> and showed me directions in the midst of, like, so, mu so many motorcycles. Um, <laughs> I would, I would start the romance there. <laughs> I was, I was, uh, I, 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 ugh, this is embarrassing. So I went out like last night uh, and had a couple beers because um, I'm like, you know, I, I can go out now. That there's no kids at home and my wife's like, go have fun, just don't be an idiot. I'm like, okay, I won't. Uh, and it was like two in the morning and uh, I was like, hmm, I had a giant meal before, but I am hungry. So there was a, there was a, there was a hamburger place and, and I was just like flush with the joy of I can do whatever I want. So I was like, I have a veggie burger and a cheeseburger and a chicken burger on the menu. I don't get all three, sir. So I got all three of them and I took them home and I was like bopping and so happy and I got back to the hotel room and I laid everything on the desk and I was like, I'll just take a bite of each one. I don't need to finish them. And then like they were all gone within the course of like three minutes and I'm just looking at just, just a like, murder the, scene it, it was a murder a burger a burger murder in front of me and I'm just like looking at the detritus of this and it and it was it went from the the greatest night of my life to I am a fucking horrible human being this is so sad that like I, like all my joy just evaporated in a heartbeat and I just like sat there solemnly I, I swear to you for like a minute just like like <laughs> Should I, should I, should I, should I like drink a lot of water now or make myself puke or this is horror? I feel like puking. Should I? Puke? Like no, just sit with it, you moron. You made your choice. <laughs> what what Kevin is not telling you is that the night before he ate the entire mini bar. Did you? Like, <laughs> not just some of the mini bar. The entire the, mini the bar. Whole, I, ate the, I, I respect did, that. I really did. I ate the whole thing. It was. I went out again, I, you know, it's like, hey, honey, go ahead and have fun. So I did, I and then I got back story. to the room, and there's like a little, there was a, there's a little, there's a little tray of snacks, you know? It's not a little tray, it's a big tray. And 
I'm like, I'll just have one of you and one of you. And it was dark in the room. And then I woke up in the morning and like, there's like a half eaten bag of nuts on the bed. I'm like, what happened to the tray of snacks? And I was like, you son of a bitch. Like it's all in there. And uh, yeah. Does your wife not let you eat? <laughs> she, she doesn't. She's like, you can't ever eat. <laughs> I'm going to prove it to you, show you. Justin, did you just get away with making your funny story into Kevin's story? <laughs> uh, I didn't have a funny story, but what was really fun about this weekend was getting to spend time with uh, uh, some members of our cast and just hearing them talk. I was pulling definite stories from them. Uh, uh, Angelique Cabral uh, was talking about the fact that she has this, this adorable dog that she loves, 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 and the dog had been fixed, um, and then she started to notice that the dog um, seemed like it was humping a lot of things, and it wouldn't stop humping, and then she saw its sexual... Uh, expressiveness that dogs have that some people call lipstick or whatever you want to call it. Um, I like and, sexual expressiveness. Right. And, and that it was like actively sexual but it had been fixed and it turned out that they had missed a ball. So I was like this is going, this is going, this is going in the show. They missed a ball and you would think that they would have counted. You know? It's a pretty quick count. Yeah. One, two. Right done. And Dana, do you have a story? Oh, I am not a writer. Um, <laughs> I, got, I got lost and went to the wrong Amy's ice cream last night at two, like one, two in the morning, but I was at Amy's ice cream, so it was good. Um, <laughs> and then I went to Home Slice, and uh, I also, I mean, I didn't, I just had one slice, but <laughs> I don't know. It's honestly, it's just been like the most amazing weekend. Like this, this, like you guys are amazing. <laughs> like I'm blown away by the audiences here, pandering, but it's super true. Like I'm, I've been blown away by all the questions. Been blown away by the panels. Like you guys are just really smart and thoughtful. Well, that seems like a good place to end. I would say. <laughs> thank you so much to uh, Jenny, Kevin, Justin, and Dana, and thank you all for coming out this morning.